It's my privilege to introduce the moderator for tonight's program, uh, Dan McGrath, a native Chicagoan, who's also associate managing editor for sports at the Chicago Tribune, um, a former baseball writer and a lifelong baseball fan. He's been interested in the Black Sox scandal since the early 1960s, um, when his father went to his grave proclaiming Buck Weaver's innocence. So he's personally connected to this and very glad to be here. So I'm going to introduce Dan McGrath. Thank you very much, Josh. It's a great privilege for me to be here. Uh, as Josh mentioned, uh, obviously, this is a, one of the all-time great, uh, not only sports stories, but historical stories, especially here in Chicago. My father uh, had the great privilege to know Buck Weaver very well over time. He was a policeman. Back in the 40s and 50s, when he was trying to raise seven kids, he would work side jobs. And one of those was ballpark security and racetrack security and, and, and pretty much anything he could find on his days off. And he uh, was working security at uh, Sportsman's Park, where Buck was a paramutual clerk. And they became fast friends. And uh, my father was a great baseball fan, a White Sox fan. I'm sure it. Uh, breaks his heart that I work for the Tribune, which owns the Cubs, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, he used to come home and he'd tell stories about Buck and how wrong, he was a little guy when it happened, but even back then he was a White Sox fan and, and he remembered it very well, the, the newspaper accounts and uh, his favorite team being decimated by this. And then as he got to know Buck Weaver pretty well and Buck told him the inside story of what really happened, he was really, really hurt by how wrong this man had been. And uh, he'd tell me the stories that Buck had told him, and I just became fascinated by it. And uh, my first day at the Tribune, I went down into the morgue and went through the clips, and uh, I probably missed about five assignments I should have been doing because I was so fascinated to read these eyewitness accounts of what had really happened. And I think it's, it's just remarkable that here it is 85 years later, and there is still this level of interest in it we could get a crowd like this out on a night when uh, the vice president, presidential candidates are debating and we've got the Yankees and Twins playing the playoff game. Of course, we don't care about the Yankees, do we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only if they lose. But it's a great privilege to be here, and um, I want to uh, introduce my fellow panelists, and then we're going to show a little bit of a trailer from the movie Eight Men Out, which uh, a John Sayles film, which, along with this book by Elliot Asinoff, I think explains what happens in remarkable detail. It's a great book. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. And the movie would be great to have in, in DVD. And we can talk about that a little later, but uh, let's get started. To my immediate right is Dr. David Fletcher. Dr. Fletcher is an occupational me <clears throat> medicine specialist and co-founder of SafeWorks Illinois, a private medical practice he operates in downstate Illinois. Dr. Fletcher is a noted national expert in occupational health and is clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Dr. Fletcher, a passionate baseball fan and native Chicagoan, was married in 1998 at the site of the original Comiskey Park home plate. Last summer, he launched clearbuck.com, a campaign devoted to reinstating former White Sox third baseman Buck Weaver to Major League Baseball. Dr. Fletcher is currently working on a movie treatment about Buck Weaver's life plans for a Chicago baseball museum across from U.S. Cellular Field. David Fletcher. <laughs> to my left is Tom Cannon, an experienced trial and appellate lawyer with an extensive background in complex litigation. That sentence was written by a lawyer, I have <laughs> Quoted as a legal authority in numerous publications, Tom has been named Lawyer of the Year by the Milwaukee Bar Association. He also has been awarded the Positor Foundation Pro Bono Publico Award for his work in providing free legal advice to homeless persons. Tom is the grandson of Raymond J. Cannon, the Milwaukee lawyer who represented shoeless Joe Jackson in the 1924 civil trial in Milwaukee. Tom possesses the trial transcripts and ex exhibits from that proceeding. I uh, was pleased to make Tom's acquaintance when I got here. He also has uh, extensive knowledge of some of the other things we're going to be talking about. His father, Robert Cannon, was there at the uh, creation of the Major League Baseball Players Union. You know, nowadays we read about players making an average of $2.5 million a year and getting more meal money in a month than people like Buck and Shoeless Joe Jackson made in a season. And the Players Union has had a lot to do with that. 
and the union was instrumental in ending these practices that created the climate by which uh, the Black Sox scandal was allowed to take place. So Tom will just be a font of information and background on what we're here to talk about tonight. Tom Cannon. Uh, to David's right is, in my mind, the guest of honor, Patricia Anderson, the niece of Buck Weaver. Patricia knows all too well the pain in 1919 white that Buck Weaver went through after his banishment from baseball. In 1931, after her father passed away, Patricia, her mother, and her sister Betty moved in with Buck and Helen Weaver. She was just four years old. Patricia worked at a neighborhood drugstore while attending Calumet High School in Chicago. Upon graduation, she began working at the Chicago Sun-Times. In 1948, she married Gordon Anderson and eventually left the Sun-Times to raise her three daughters and one son. She now has six grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Patricia has fond memories of Uncle Buck trying to teach her how to throw a baseball or a softball. She said Buck eventually gave up that endeavor, <laughs> but his memory lives on in her, in her work to have him cleared and reinstated into Major League Baseball. Patricia Anderson. Finally, last but certainly not least in an election year, <laughs> Tom's left is Representative Patty Bellick, an Illinois state representative who entered the state legislature in January 1999. Now in her third term and running for a fourth, Representative, representative Bellick's assignments include the Financial Institutions Committee and Labor Committee. She is also a spokesperson for the Committee on Human Services and the Mental Health and Developmentally Disabled. A native of River Forest, Mrs. Bellick graduated from St. Norbert College, that's uh, Green Bay Packer Toyota Territory, for any of you who don't know, where she received a bachelor's degree in history and American government. She taught school in Fairbanks, Alaska, and in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and served as vice president of a sports investment firm in the private sector. Now, why she is here. Patty Bellick is so proud of her great grandfather, Charles A. Comiskey, and his contributions to the history of baseball. Not only as the founder of the White Sox, but as the founder of the American League, a player manager, and as the first first baseman to play off the bag. He was a man ahead of his times, and certainly a person who figures in our conversation tonight. Patty Bellick. Edward Seacott, Joseph Jefferson Jackson, Arnold Gandil, Charles Risberg. Oscar Felch, Claude Williams, and George Weaver are hereby accused of conspiracy to commit a confidence game. We gotta see the clock. Baseball, 1919. There were no free agents, no million dollar salaries, but there was a team no one could beat. The true story of the team they called the Black Sox and the scandal that broke the heart of a nation. Any bet against my Sox this series is a sucker bet. You can find seven men on the best club willing to throw the World Series. Come on, Joe! The Joe ain't in. I ain't. You want me? You don't want to be stupid, do you, Joe? Now, you just sign your name right there, Joe. I made an agreement with those guys. A couple of Boy Scouts here, they made a deal. The players are in now. What are they going to do, call a cop? What you got it off for, Eddie? Eddie can dump three games all on his own. We don't get Eddie, we forget about it. How many games does Mr. Seacott win for us this year? 29, sir. You said if I won 30 games, there'd be a $10,000 bonus. 29 is not 30, Eddie. I want to make the play I'll feel right. You can't watch on these guys. I can't do it. I know what you're doing. After you've gone and left me crying. They were an American dream come true. The best that ever were. Nine men took the field. But when the game was over, there were eight men out. What do you think of these players of yours now, Mr. Gleason? I think they're the greatest ball club I ever seen, period. Don't you forget it. Eight Men Out, written for the screen and directed by John Sayles. It's a good way to set the mood. It's, mm -hmm. it's an amazing movie. It's such a good period piece. The music and the sets and the actors. Uh, 
It was just a tremendous film. If you haven't seen it, I, I would rent it or uh, buy it on DVD because it really tells the story of what happened. Um, baseball, Major League Baseball, obviously was a much, much different game back then. Uh, it was a blue collar endeavor. It was uh, mostly southern and rural in its roots. A lot of the players came from uh, company mill towns. They were uh, hard-edged guys. Um, the salaries were <coughs> modest, to say the least. Um, everything was tilted on behalf of the owners. Uh, it was common practice to offer a player like Joe Jackson a three-year contract and then insert a 10-day clause, which meant that if he got injured, the contract could be nullified for any reason over a period of 10 days, so he would never get the money that he had coming to him. Um, part of the reason the White Sox were so successful was uh, Mr. Comiskey's background as a player. He really knew talent, and he knew where the players were, and he was able to go out and uh, assemble this team that was unbelievably good for the time. A heavy, heavy favorite over the Reds in that year's World Series. And um, nowadays, the way that uh, gambling is monitored, a shift in the odds as uh, that, when that much money was bet, would create a shift in the odds that would create a great deal of suspicion. I guess in a way that answers the question of whether it could happen today, but on the other hand, there's so much money involved today that you almost couldn't justify, you couldn't win enough <laughs> to justify what you would throw away uh, at the risk of being caught. So the answer to that is probably no. Um, it was a, obviously it was a really white game. Jackie Robinson didn't come along until uh, 25 years later. 28 years later, um, the, it was probably poorly governed. Uh, the National League had been in business for a while. The American League came along a little later. There was no commissioner. There was a national commission consisting of the presidents of both leagues and a third guy who was supposed to uh, resolve disputes, of which there were many. And it's just hard to imagine when you see what a spectacle of baseball and all professional sports have become in this day and age. Um, how simple it was back then. Gambling, unfortunately, was not uh, the exclusive purview of the Black Sox. Uh, it was very common back then. And there was a first baseman named Hal Chase, who was probably, nowadays he'd be, uh, bounce around from team to team. Nowadays, with free agency, that's not uncommon. But back then, Hal Chase bounced around from team to team because his managers and the owners never knew whether he was on the square or not. He had a reputation as uh, a master fixer, and he played first base. And there are very other than pitcher, there probably isn't another position that can outcome that can uh, affect the outcome of a game as effectively as uh, as the first baseman could. Uh, Tris Speaker and Ty Cobb were implicated in, in a bit of uh, rumors about gambling and. It was really the tenor of the times. And um, when Landis, Kennesaw Mountain Landis took over as the commissioner, he had an absolute mandate to clean it up, which is certainly why he came down in the Black Sox as hard as he did, even though they were acquitted in a court of law. 